Welcome back, everybody, to a new episode of Podcast on the Brink. I know it's been a while. Summer has been quiet in terms of IU basketball news. We, we took a little time off, but we are back now with the calendar recently turning to August and Indiana preparing for its trip to the Bahamas, which will start later this week. And for Inside the Hall, Tyler Toshman will be there on the ground. He's 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 uh he's sacrificing himself to go to Atlantis. Tyler, how did we get you to agree to this assignment? Yeah, man, this this job is really rough. I can't believe that I'm being forced out to a beach and uh just to watch basketball too. That's it's pretty rough, I have to say. So I can say from experience that these these foreign trips are uh very um from a media perspective, I think very valuable. Um, back in 2014, I had the opportunity. It was obviously not at a beach, but uh, to go up to Montreal and watch Indiana play five exhibition games up there. Uh, this trip a little bit different in that Indiana is only going to be playing uh, two games uh, down in the Bahamas against the same team twice. Before we get into that, Tyler, uh, you've recently started writing again for Inside the Hall. I know you're going to be doing some stuff this fall for the Hoosier Network covering IU football, but a lot of people asked me this summer kind of where you were and you were out in Portland, Oregon, uh, interning at the Oregonian. I know uh, with COVID and everything, it was a little bit different of an experience than what a typical internship uh, would be, but you were out there for was it six weeks? I think what was that, you know, just kind of fill everybody in on, on kind of what that experience was like and, and what maybe you got out of it. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I kind of said that, uh, you know, I grew up in Chapel Hill, so I, I know about the East coast and then obviously going to IU. So I've been living in the Midwest, but this was kind of my first extended experience on the West coast. So I feel like I'm, you know, more cultured now and kind of, you know, have a, a broader sports background. But, um, you know, it, it was a lot of fun. I, I got a ton of experience. They, I was pretty much just kind of a handyman doing whatever they needed. So, um, you know, I was at high school basketball games. I covered soccer, which is something that I, I, a sport I wasn't really familiar with. Um, but, I mean, I, I have a much greater appreciation for it now. And, um, you know, it was the, the fans there are extremely passionate about soccer. So it was kind of cool to see that side of it. And um, with the uh, – the Olympic track and field stuff going on. I covered the trials. So oh, if, you know, if you watch the Olympics recently, uh, I saw a lot of them kind of at least virtually or, or interviewing them on zoom um, before they got to Tokyo. So, um, you know, it, it was a really good experience just to, um, you know, get a whole lot of different experience of talking to athletes with different backgrounds and just different sports. So, you know, it was, it was something that, uh, you know, I, I think that I look back on now and it was definitely a, a good uh, good thing for me to do. I also remember talking to you at one point when they were having record heat out in Portland. I know at one point you told me, because I, I think you told me the place that you were staying in, the Airbnb didn't have air conditioning. And I was I was thinking to myself, what what's going on with this? I remember you telling me at one point you were like taking ice out of the freezer and trying to cool yourself down in the middle of the night. It was so hot. What was What was that like? Yeah, I, I compared it to because, like I said, I'm from Chapel Hill and, and people don't really know what to do when it snows here. Like in Indiana, you know, people are prepared, like they kind of know, you know, their snow piles and everything. But in Chapel Hill, it snows and you know, people are you know going rushing to the grocery store, buying toilet paper, water, everything. The shelves are cleared out. And that's what it was like in Oregon, because apparently I didn't really know. But the, like these these temperatures, people did not. Uh, they weren't used to, and it's not something that usually happens out there. So I had like one little vent. Um, and so I kind of just sat in front of it, like put my face in front of it because like there was no other way uh, to stay cool. And, and you could feel it. Like I'd be in front of the vent and then I'd walk into my kitchen and like the Airbnb I was renting. And like, you could feel it was like 20 degrees hotter just in the kitchen from like from the vent to the kitchen. It was insane. And like, so I was, I was opening up my freezer and sticking my head in for like a couple of minutes just to try to stay cool. But man, that was like a brutal couple of days. And, uh, man, yeah, I'm glad to be back where there's air conditioning for sure. I have a much greater appreciation for that. 
So you're back in Chapel Hill now, but a couple of days from now, you're going to be uh, heading down uh, to the Bahamas. And, and on Friday, we had the opportunity uh, to talk to Mike Woodson. First time that he's been uh, available to us as media since I think it was late May when he when he talked to us. And we had a, a chance to talk to three players as well. I know there's going to be some more content coming out from uh, those interviews. And obviously, you'll have coverage of everything down in the Bahamas. But just big picture, what are you most uh interested in learning from from this trip just in terms of indiana basketball obviously there's a new coach uh new system uh, a lot of new players i'm just curious from your perspective what are, are the things that you're uh, most looking forward to, to learning about this group uh, from these exhibition games i think one thing is definitely just the lineup combos because uh, mike woodson touched upon this a little bit on friday but i mean there's probably looking at the roster, there's realistically nine guys that could start. There's just so many different combos of guys. And the guy that is probably the only lock is Trace Jackson Davis. So there's just a ton of potential lineups, starting lineups, guys coming off the bench. And Mike Woodson said he wanted to play 10 guys. So you could possibly see kind of like a platoon um, almost, but just to see like how these new guys fit in, who, who, what combos kind of play well together, Um, seeing how Trace fits into the system in terms of last year, he had to play more five than probably, you know, he would have liked considering that he's going to be projected in the NBA as a four. So can he play the four with Michael Durr at the five? I just feel like there's just so many kind of like questions and and different lineup combos that could possibly happen. And it's just going to be interesting to see kind of what the rotations look like. Um, And I'm also just kind of interested to see the, you know, there's been so much talk of this four out one in offense and just to see how this figures to be. And and that's kind of one of my biggest concerns for Indiana entering this season is that they're, you're taking a team that's not a good three point shooting. Like, you know, the last couple of years, not shot the three well and trying to make it into a team that that is like a crucial part of the offense. And, and they, of course, they bring in, you know, Miller Cop that can shoot Parker Stewart. We haven't seen him at all. They bring in guys that can shoot. But, you know, making that transition is it's a little bit worrisome for me entering the season. But I am just kind of curious to see that getting this first look of, you know, how the offense is and, um, you know, can can is this something that is sustainable and can work? Yeah, I agree with you a lot on the lineup stuff, because as much as it, it's not all that smart to read into lineups and exhibition games uh, in August in the Bahamas. I do think it does give us a little bit of insight. You know, that first game who starts that to me, that tells us who's earned it to this point and who's had a strong summer. I think the point guard situation is one of the more interesting, uh, if you want to call it a battle, you know, a lot of times in football, you'll talk about, quarterback battle through spring practice and summer and somebody's named the starter with, with IU basketball this year, you know, the point guard uh, battle is interesting because on one sense you have the incumbent Rob Fennessy, who's started for a good portion of his first three seasons uh, in Bloomington. Uh, Mike Woodson talked really positively. I thought about him on Friday, but you also have, you know, a, a kid returning that's a five star prospect that's going to expect to play after going into the transfer portal and, 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 uh, really, you know, he has, uh, NBA aspirations, uh, no doubt Christian Lander at some point, but didn't really prove a lot as a, as a freshman. But not only are those two back, you're adding Xavier Johnson, who's coming in from Pitt and had a ton of, uh, you know, experience there, a lot of success in terms of individual numbers, didn't win a lot. But he's also a guy that's definitely expecting uh, to come in and play. How do you see that? You know, what what I guess what are you going to be watching for from those three guys, and how do you kind of you know forecast that situation playing out? Because you don't necessarily see too many instances where teams are playing three different guys at point guard uh, heavy minutes. It's usually a, you know you know a point guard that that starts and plays you know thirty thirty two minutes, and then you have a backup. Do you see those? guys maybe playing together a little bit or, or how, how do you see that kind of working out as we, as we enter this trip? Yeah, I guess first off, just, you know, I think the Xavier Johnson addition is, uh, you know, I think it's a very 
promising element for Indiana and very intriguing because, you know, over the last couple of years, there's been no guy really that they that Indiana can hand the ball to and say, just beat your guy off the dribble. Just go make plays. Take take this guy one on one and just beat him. You know, I, I can't really remember too many times last year where a guard took someone off the dribble and dumped it off to Trace or some other big man and there was just like an easy two. Like I, I just, you know, as long as far as I can remember, that just did not happen that much last season. And he kind of brings that element, Xavier Johnson. He, you know, um, he's very elusive. He, he can beat guys off the dribble, you know, from, from the film I've watched, uh, you know, he, he can, t- he can get downhill pretty quickly and, and take guys um, to the rim. So I think, you know, that element of his game is something that can really play out well, potentially for Indiana. And, you know, it, it is very interesting with those three guys because, you know, Mike Woodson said, obviously, you know, the point guard position is they're going to, you know, it goes without saying, but it's going to be, you know, in their hands a lot of the time. And I feel like last year, you know, there wasn't that guy that demanded the ball at the end of the game and really kind of took control. Um, so, you know, to see if Rob Finnessy can kind of, uh, you know, find some of that aggressiveness and, and that, you know, kind of more, you know, obviously he's a stoic guy, but, you know, kind of more demonstrative leadership. And, you know, just with that room with the three guys is, you know, I, I think that you can look and, and play two of them at the same time. Um, and I think, you know, I, I wrote something, I don't know when it's going to you know come out, but I, I could see, I think of the three of them, Rob Finnessy playing the most off the ball, just because it seems that Lander and, and Xavier Johnson, uh, you know, can are more, you know, a little quicker, a little bit more elusive, uh, can make more plays with the ball in their hands. And I think, you know, Rob Finnessy, he can shoot. He, he hasn't really done it at a consistent clip since he's been here. But, you know, if you put him on the wing and you know, get the defense contracting in a little bit and then kick it out to him. And he has a little bit more space and, and can catch it in rhythm. You know, maybe he can be a mid thirties to upper thirties, three point shooter. And, and, you know, you can get a lot more out of him while also being able to play Lander and Xavier Johnson more. But, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, if you can't play two of them at the same time, then, you know, kind of in a difficult situation because you're looking at, most likely one of those three guys will be cut significantly out of the rotation because I don't, I couldn't really see a situation where you're going to go three point guards deep, um, you know, with all getting significant playing time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's going to be interesting to see how, how it plays out. And I guess, you know, we'll get our first look at it this week. I want to talk a little bit about Lander for a second because you watched, you were at games last year, you watched up close and, uh, you know, I, I had the vantage point of watching on TV, but it was almost painful at times to watch later in the season. It, there was, I don't remember if it was a streak or if it was just something where he missed so many layups in a row where he, you know, all those two pointers um, just from watching him last year, what were your observations of him as a player? And do you, do you still see significant upside uh, in him and, and can he help Indiana uh, in any, in any meaningful way this upcoming season? But yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think he can. And, and I didn't personally watch him in person in high school, you know, just watching, watching some film. But, um, you know, obviously he has a talent. A lot of people have seen it. And, you know, uh, he, came er- he came a year early in a COVID, you know, year. He's not, he didn't have the same transition. There's a lot of things that you can point to last season and say, you know, he didn't have quite the whole process and pieces that would have been available in a normal year if he was in, in his original class. And actually I would have been interested to see if that, if he knew COVID and stuff was happening, if he still would have decided to reclass, you know, maybe the answer would have been yes. And, you know, he, he's glad he had to go through last year just to be able to learn. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but, you know, I think that that one thing that sticks out to me for him is that I remember is was, was at the Ohio state game. And uh, Tom Ostrom, it was like, I think he made a turnover. I can't really remember, but it was like a, a little stoppage in play. And Tom Ostrom pulled him aside and he was like, Christian, run the team. Like he was like trying to instill some confidence in him and like, you know, having trying to make him take charge of, of what was going on on the court. And I think what we saw is just how difficult it was for someone, you know, how as young as he was playing in a physical league like the Big Ten where, you know, anybody, anybody that's trying to adjust is going to have a difficult time. And, and just like you were saying with those, those missed layups, you could, you could see like how much he was kind of getting in his own head and how much that was affecting him. Cause that, those are layups that, I mean, he, 
he's probably going to make like 999 times out of a thousand. Um, but you know, you know, those, co- those compounded. Um, and so, you know, I think that he is probably one of the more interesting storylines just in terms of how much he can progress from this season at last, just kind of trying to, you know, get a gauge of you know, what he looks like exactly moving forward. The wing rotation is, is interesting too, because in one sense you have Armand Franklin, who was Indiana's most reliable perimeter shooter, most reliable scorer uh, outside of Tra- Trace Jackson Davis. He's gone, so there's opportunity that's there uh, for the taking. Uh, but you have Parker Stewart, who transferred in uh, from Pitt. Or, sorry, no, UT, uh, I think it was what, UT Martin maybe, that he uh, tr- transferred in from, originally started his career um, at Pitt, and then um, went to UT Martin, and then obviously uh, the unfortunate uh, passing of his father, he, he transferred to Indiana, didn't play last season, but he's a guy that, that Woodson's uh, talked a little bit about on Friday, at one point was one of uh, the better uh, players Indiana had uh, over the summer. You also have Tamar Bates coming in as a five-star kid, uh, late addition. Uh, he's going to obviously probably uh, contend for minutes. And then you have guys like Anthony Leal and and Trey Galloway returning. And I thought it was interesting that that Woodson brought up Galloway on Friday by name uh, when he was asked. Uh, you know, that wasn't a name I was expecting to hear. Not that I don't think Galloway is capable of – uh, being a productive contributor to this team, uh, it was just a, not a name that I was necessarily expecting uh, uh, to hear in the context of which it was asked. Which I think it was something: who were your best scorers or best, you know, who, who was who impressed you this summer? Um, so those four guys, getting a look at them, what, what you know, out of you know, maybe go through each of those guys and, and just what are you maybe looking to see out of them uh, down in the Bahamas? You know, you can start with with Parker Stewart and Tamar Bates, and then uh, you know talk about the returnees, Anthony Leal uh, and Trey Galloway. Yeah, I mean, with with Bates and uh, Parker Stewart, I mean, just like I was mentioning before about the lack of shooting and trying to play a four out one in offense. I mean it's going to be imperative that they can shoot like that. That's kind of what they're there for at this point. Um, you know, I, it, from what I've seen tomorrow, base can put the ball on the floor. I, I don't think I'd seen as much of that from Parker Stewart. He looked more like a guy that was a, a perimeter threat, but I mean, I think for Indiana success, like it's just going to be key for them to be able to at, at points, possibly just camp out on the, on this, you know, three point line and make shots. Like, because that's just going to open up a lot more inside for Trace Jackson Davis is going to open up uh, just the whole game in terms of being able to drive and kick out. And that's when you really see the offense get moving uh, because you have to, if you can, if, if Indiana can make defenses have to choose between guarding someone on the three point line and guarding Trace Jackson Davis, like that's the optimal situation because what we saw kind of last season is they could sag off shooters and um you know collapse on trace and and it just becomes a lot more difficult for him um so i I mean i think for those guys that's just going to be what's what's most important and you know i think it's really interesting trey galloway because he just doesn't he doesn't really fit into as much of the system i think like race thompson is kind of the same way he's he's more of a traditional he fits into a traditional lineup a a trey is more of a slasher and, and race can't step out as much but you know, I think you know, it was interesting that Mike Woodson mentioned Trey Galloway. Um, but you know, it, it's it's I guess it, it talks it speaks to his character that I think it was pretty recently after Archie Miller got fired, and there was a report that he was like, "I'm staying with Indiana." It was the same with Anthony Leal, and I, I didn't really mention Leal with uh, Bates and and Stewart, but you know, him him making threes kind of goes without saying. But I think it is interesting with Galloway just. As soon as Archie Miller gets fired, he's you know he's steadfast with Indiana, and that he didn't even know who the new coach was going to be. He didn't know that they're going to bring in Parker Stewart and you know Miller Cop and Tamar Bates, and he's already committed to Indiana. I think that just speaks a lot for the type of you know person and teammate he is, and how committed he is to Indiana. Yeah, and when I mentioned those four guys, I didn't even mention Miller Cop, and that kind of speaks to the depth that Indiana has on the on the wing, and that's. I'm really interested to see how just that whole rotation kind of shakes out because 
you know, cops, another guy, I mean, he's, he's played a ton of minutes in the big 10. He's averaged, I think, double figures at Northwestern. You know, he was a big reason that Northwestern came into Bloomington last season and beat Indiana. He was, he's a shot maker. And I think he's a guy that you'll look at and, and say, uh, he's going to have a role with Trace Jackson Davis, you know, Woodson, kind of pointed at him and talked about his improvement this summer, which was interesting to me because he was already Indiana's best player. So if he's going up another level, um, you know, I, I think there there are some selfish reasons if you're Woodson to mention him because if if you're going to bring him back, you know, try to talk him into coming back, you obviously want him to get better. So you want to kind of talk that up and, and kind of point that out. And this is a place where we can develop you and, and make you better. But you know, to consider Trace Jackson Davis better, what do you need to see? Uh, I, I don't know what you're going to see uh, in the Bahamas in these two games. I mean, they're, they're going to be playing potentially some some really high level competition, but beyond that, what do you need to see out of Trace Jackson Davis this coming season to consider him a better player? I, I don't think it's obviously statistic wise. I don't think there's anything specific you're going to look at and say he has to do this or that. But I, there's got to be other. Uh, things that you're looking for uh, as he enters his junior season to say he's he's taken a step forward. What would those things be in your mind? I mean, I think the things that have been mentioned kind of over and over is his right hand and his jump shot. Like that, that's kind of been worn out. I feel like in terms of just you know, and, and it's true that it's for good reason, but it's just been talked about a lot. And when Mike Woodson mentioned Trace Jackson Davis improving in this offseason he didn't even mention you know the jump shot in the right hand which I thought was interesting it, it was more about him being more aggressive and um and him uh being in better physical condition but um so you know I think that that was interesting but I mean I think obviously that the two main things are just the, the right hand and the the jump shot but the other thing that I would look at is looking back at Indiana season uh a year ago there was not a guy that you could hand the ball to with, you know, you need, you need a bucket and you're down by one and it's the, it's the final play of the game. There's no one that they could hand the ball off to and, and just go get a bucket. I think we saw like at the Wisconsin game, they at Wisconsin, the, you know, a game they probably should have won. Uh, Al Durham, they gave Al Durham a crack at it. They gave Trace a crack at it and he missed that, that little bunny, uh, you know, right at the rim. And so I think try, like needing to be that guy that demands the ball at the end of the game and that can make those shots, um, and even up close, because there was a lot of times last year where he said he was getting in his own head and he was missing these little two-footers that he knows that he needs to make. So I think that that's another thing is probably just working on the mental aspect of it because you know, he, you know, he said that he, he knew that he gets into his head. So probably just letting – he's put enough work in and just letting his skill take over. Yeah, I mean, I think I need to see him be more assertive and take on the challenge of just being dominant, right? Like, the, there's a lot of the games where he put up statistics, but I, I think if you're going to be considered, I saw one list, I, I don't know, it was some website ranking the top 100 players in the country going into next season. I saw him at number seven. If he's really going to be that, he needs to be night in, night out, a dominant player. He can't be the guy that, struggles against Miles Johnson and Rutgers or against Kofi Coburn, uh, he's he's neutralized. He's got to come up with other ways to be effective. Uh, if he's going up against a guy that has overmatched him in the paint, uh, he's got to move uh, without the ball better and, and get himself in positions to, to get easier buckets. He's got to be able to show that he can step out to 12 to 15 feet. I mean, a lot of people are, you know, We'll, we'll tr- asking, will Trey shoot threes? Well, I don't necessarily think he needs to shoot threes, but if he's going to play together with Race Thompson, he's got to at least be able to step out to the free throw line uh, extended and make a shot. I think he's going to have the freedom to do that, but that freedom is only going to be there as long as he can prove that he can make that shot. And to me, that's one of the interesting things about Indiana this season is you talk about this four-out, one-in system, well, to me, that says Brace or Trace is going to have to be able to stretch the floor at some point because, you know, I, I think the biggest frustration point for a lot of Indiana fans these last really three seasons, uh, you know, two, two, two to three seasons, um, is that they, they've always played these big guys together um, that can't seem to get out of each other's way at times, right? It clogs the paint. And going back to the Romeo season, 
there was instances where um, you know you're playing Justin Smith and he can't help stretch the floor at all and it clogs the lane up and and I think last year was was somewhat of the same thing where you where you're playing too many guys together on the floor who can't um, shoot outside of five or six feet. So to me, it's not with, with Trace. It's it's can he dominate uh, consistently and can he you know at least keep the defense honest a little bit and step out. I'm not saying like I said, don't have to shoot threes, but can you shoot from twelve to fifteen feet uh, reliably? Um, in in terms of this trip coming up. What, uh, to your understanding, uh, is kind of the itinerary, at least for IU, once they get down there? I know there's going to be maybe an opportunity for you to watch a practice. Uh, There's a Friday night game. There's a Sunday afternoon game. Uh, People have been asking me how they can watch the games. Well, there's no TV for these games, so they're going to be glued to your Twitter account. You're going to be trying to tweet, take video, take notes. So so good luck with that. But what what what's kind of your... uh, uh, understanding of what the itinerary is going to be like and, and kind of some of the ways that, uh, that uh, people are going to be able to follow your coverage down there. Yeah, so uh, I'm supposed to get down there Wednesday and Thursday there's supposed to be an open practice that media can attend and we are supposed to be able to talk to some select players after. So, um, you know, hopefully – that that goes through and and I'll, we'll be able to do that so I would be looking forward to doing that and talking to maybe some guys that we haven't heard you know a lot from in over the last or since the season ended or you know even going back into last season so um you know looking forward to that hopefully and then you yeah, have the games uh Friday and Sunday you know I, to my understanding there's not going to be any other open practices uh so um, that that's kind of what I what I have heard of what will be happening, and and yeah, I'm you know I'm gonna be scouting out to see where I'll be able to put the camera, and apparently it'll only be on the baseline, and that's not where the you know media section is. So maybe I'll be squatting on the baseline with a computer on my lap, trying to make sure that the video is good, and you know, I might as I might be selling some hot dogs while I'm at it too. I might as well. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to get down there, and that's uh, you know looking forward to talking to some of the guys. And and, uh, and actually, I didn't mention either that uh, we will be able to talk to Coach Woodson after the games. So um, be interesting to you know hear his per- perspective and kind of in a normal game setting. So and it will also be my first in person media in like a year, a year plus probably. So yeah, looking forward to that. Do you think it matters at all if Indiana wins these games, or do you think it's irrelevant? I I'd, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock into it. I I feel like it's something that will be like quickly a red flag to fans if they see like why is Indiana you know losing? And but I think like I mean BC Mega I, I haven't done like extensive research into them, but they're they're in the top league, and I think Serbia is it. And yeah. and looking down their roster, I mean. They have Nikola Jovic. He's he's supposed to be a top ten draft Big pick in the in, in the in the twenty twenty two draft. He's six ten. He just turned eighteen, and he averaged fifteen. He I think he averaged a triple double from when I saw last season. So, I mean, this is not a team that's gonna like roll over. Like this is, and you know, I'm sure they've been playing for longer together than Indiana. So, um, and then there's also they also have Philip Petrusev who who played at Gonzaga a couple years ago. So. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's a serious roster. It's not like they're going and playing some rec team. So Right. You don't know exactly who actually makes it there, uh, if they bring everybody. But, uh, you know, my understanding is they also have Scoochie Smith, or did last year, who played point guard uh, at Dayton under Archie Miller. It was one of the things that a lot of people talked about Archie Miller uh, at Indiana. Well, he needs to get a point guard like, Sco- like he had at Dayton, like Scoochie Smith. Well, we're going to see how good uh, Scoochie Smith is if he plays against Indiana. So I think it's... Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, it definitely makes you do a double take when you see this team could potentially have a lottery pick because Indiana. I'm looking at their roster; they don't have a lottery pick on their team. Uh, you know, Trey Jackson Davis is going to be a guy that that maybe makes the NBA, but I, you know, there's there's been mock drafts come out for next year, and uh, I've seen some that have him and some see that don't, and they're all uh, in the second round. So. 
Yeah, I mean, professional basketball in Serbia is is, is no joke. They've uh, produced a ton of, of high level players, and and you can be uh, sure that they're going to be looking at, at this as an opportunity to um, to win a couple games uh, against Indiana um, in in what what should be a, a pretty uh, unique environment. I've never been to the uh, to Atlanta. So, you know, I've heard a lot of good things. I know that's where they have a uh, battle for Atlantis every year. And it seems like it's a pretty intimate uh, environment to, to watch games. So it'll be, it'll be interesting uh, to see that. And, and, you know, after that concludes Tyler, you'll be heading back to uh, Bloomington to uh, I believe start covering IU football and, and, and start your uh, junior year uh, in Bloomington as a student. What, what are you looking forward to the most about getting back to Bloomington? Is it just uh, some of your favorite favorite food spots or kind of be just being back on campus? It sounds like uh, it's going to be pretty similar. Are, are most of your classes going to be in person this fall? And I know last year you were virtual for most of that. I think I, I have a couple online, but I will be in person uh, for a couple. I think that's probably one of the biggest things I'm looking forward to is because Last year wasn't, I mean, it wasn't really a college year. We, we had, I had one in-person class on one day, the second semester, and that was it. So it was, it was no, it was no college experience at all, really. And uh, so, you know, I'm looking forward to being able to get back and go into some classes in person and, and just, I mean, it's much more fun covering teams too, when you can talk to people in, in person. I think that's probably one of the things that I missed out on the most last season was that at the big 10 tournament, being able to go into open locker rooms. And cause I mean, as a journalist, that's just, that's so much nicer than talking in a press conference setting. You can actually talk to the guys and uh, get to know them a little bit. So it's not just a little floating head on a screen. Um, but yeah, also looking forward to the food. I've missed some of the, some of the, some of the Bloomington eateries uh, probably hit yogis and uh, Buffalo uh, I like uh, social cantina too. There's a lot of places I got, I got a rotation of maybe like six or seven restaurants that I just kind of go through each weekend. So yeah. I forgot to, to ask you, what was like the coolest thing you did in Portland that was like not related to, to the work, to your work that you did? I know I encourage you to go to voodoo donuts. I think you did that at one point. Like you didn't you walk like four miles to get there or something like there and back, which kind of tells me that you really wanted a donut or you're just crazy and didn't have anything else to do. But, uh, what, what was the, what was your impressions of voodoo donuts and what did you do else? What else did you do out there besides kind of, uh, just the, the, uh, the job? I know I've mentioned this to you, but I mean, I'm thinking about a, a food spinoff, um, inside the dining hall. I don't know if, if you would be <laughs> interested in, 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 uh, putting some of that on the, on the site, but, I, I did. I walked two miles to Voodoo Donuts. I did not have a car. So um, I walked two miles there, two miles back. I got a donut with an Oreo on it and or like crushed up Oreos. And then I got a Portland cream, which is like a Boston cream. And I would give it like a, a solid like seven and a half out of 10, maybe eight. I, I, it was a very like they were both very good donuts. I, I wouldn't say the best I ever had. The, in my opinion, the best is like the freshly glazed, like it just comes, like you can watch it go through the glaze and you get it and it's just like melts in your mouth. Those are, those are, in my opinion, that's the best. Um, but outside of that, uh, I went to Mount Hood for, that was actually for an assignment. I was talking to uh, the coach for the U.S. snowboard and ski team. They were getting ready for the Olympics next winter. So I talked to the coach there and I talked to some of the people trying to qualify, some of the athletes trying to qualify. So I went up to Mount Hood and uh, there was snow on there in July. So that was kind of just weird. And it was like, it was like 65, 70 up there. So uh, apparently they have like 13 feet of snow in the winter and then it just slowly kind of shrinks, but there's enough there that it can hold. So I would say that was probably the best experience i had just kind of exploring the outdoors there and i made the mistake i didn't even know that the sun was like reflecting off of the snow and everyone was like there was wearing sunglasses and i i had no idea and so i got like sunburnt under my eye because it was just reflecting off the sun for like or off the snow for like two hours so um but yeah that that was probably probably uh 
the coolest kind of outdoorsy thing I got to see. Well, Tyler, it's good to talk to you before you uh, take on this terrible assignment of going to the Bahamas. We'll be looking forward uh, to to all your coverage down there, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, you have a good, safe trip. and And thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time uh, to join us on podcast on the brink and, and looking forward uh, to reading your stuff uh, from the Bahamas. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm looking forward to getting down there and uh, getting to the beach and, and uh, providing some good coverage. Sounds good. Well, we'll, um, we'll promise not to take another three or four week hiatus here with a uh, podcast on the brink. Like I said, it was, it was kind of a, a slow period just in terms of news uh, for IU basketball there. So we decided to take some time off, but should be back here with uh, more regular episodes as we uh, gear up for the the start of the the fall semester uh, in Bloomington. uh, Make sure you follow Tyler on Twitter um, to to read all his coverage uh, from uh, the Bahamas. And also he'll be covering uh, football this fall for the Hoosier network. So check that out as well. And uh, if you enjoy podcasts on the brink, leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you uh, consume your uh, podcasts. And we'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks, everybody, for listening and talk to you again soon.